fine. Fantastic topic this time. As you know, it's dear to my heart. We're going to be talking about risk adjustment, some of the common HCC mistakes uh, in risk adjustment. We've got several topics we're going to, to highlight. I wanted to talk about the requirements that are, that are in um, the documentation that we need. We're going to talk a little bit about CMS. We're going to talk about your coding knowledge. Uh, also the RAF score. We're going to highlight some abstraction. Then we're going to talk about those biggies uh, that give people problems. Oncology, CVAs, myocardial infarctions, obesity. And then we're going to look at the annual wellness visit. Uh, how we can abstract some things that are often captured during that once a year visit. So heads up on that. Get your little notebook ready so that you can take notes as we go. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the requirements. Why do we have to have? We need a face-to-face -face visit and now you can have a face-to-face -face video visit. Right, so telehealth doesn't work. We can't do telehealth, but we can do a visit via video. Uh, it has to be a visit related to the care of the patient. Okay, so again, you can have a, a visit with the so, uh, a social worker. The MSW can be captured. Uh, home health can be captured. These are all approved providers, but make sure that the documentation that you're capturing from has to be related to the patient. Also, as always, all of your documentation has to have support. And what do we call that? We call that meet, monitor, evaluate, assess, and treat. Very easy. And those are things you're going to have to have for your testing. It's probably one of the first things you learn, right, is the meat. We're always looking for the meat. Uh, when you're also maybe working for your clinic or the hospital system, not an MA plan, it's important that you're, you're looking to see what documentation has uh, diagnoses that were both submitted uh, for the diagnosis for the patient as well as build out on a claim because they can go out once a year, right? We have to be able to capture everything we possibly can at least once a year. And in the new year, the slates are wiped clean and we get to start all over. So was it submitted as a diagnosis and was it put on a claim? There's a slight delay tonight on uh, the slide so I may be pausing between them but that's okay because you can take notes during that time if you're in the club uh, which you are if you're a student then uh, know that this slide deck will be available to you as well as the recording and the transcript so you can go back and make notes okay uh, our coding knowledge some of the big areas that you are going to be diabetes from 8 or E8 all the way to E13. Back up just a they second. They all risk adjust. Just back up two sentences. I made you an organizer so you could see the questions, but we lost oh, you for about 10 seconds. Thank you. Ah, there's Tony. Okay. Let's start over at coding knowledge. Will that be okay? The beginning of the slide. Perfect. Okay. I don't know. You guys, I feel like my lipstick's crooked. <laughs> it's the light coming in on me. <laughs> All right. The next thing you need to know is your coding knowledge. This is very important. This is the basis of what you're going to be able to abstract because if you don't know what to abstract, how is it going to work for you, right? First thing, diabetes. Always capture diabetes whenever you can because it's a very common HCC. That means you need to understand diabetes and the disease process. The codes E8 through E13. Your big ones, of course, are going to be type 1 and type 2 diabetes. That would be E10 and E11. However, 
be aware of the others and what they mean. In addition, Z79.4, long-term insulin use. This is, this is overlooked, so you want to capture that every time that you can. Uh, remember any manifestations of the disease. So if you have a patient that's a diabetic, but they also have some type of uh, uh, cardiovascular issues like CHF, then you're going to be able to do E11.5 and then add the additional codes that, that go with that, right? The, not only the, C, the I50 code, but uh, getting that to the, the how many characters you can use. So it won't be just five, it might be E11.59, right? All heart failures, all the I50s, zeros, they all risk adjust. So what I would advise you to do is to open up your, your book, your, your ICD manual, turn in the tabular and go to I50, right? And then just Take your finger and scroll down I50 and look and see all of the different headers there and what uh, differentiates one of the codes to another. I50 point and then uh, make notes out to the side. Okay. All of your cardiomyopathy codes, they risk adjust I42. That means that you need to do the same thing. Go back a few pages uh, after you've looked at the I50, the, the um, codes, that those are like so, uh, CHF codes. The I42 codes, the cardiomyopathy, understand them. Then, often, again, overlooked is going to be pathological fractures. Now, Fractures don't generally risk adjust, right? Because they're temporary, they're, they're not chronic. But if you have a pathological fracture, that's different. And a pathological fracture could be due to a cancer. So there, there's another HCC that you can capture, but you could also be capturing uh, osteoporosis. And don't forget, both males and females can have osteoporosis. It's just not, it's not just a female thing. So you would have two codes. You would have maybe a fractured uh, femur, and then you would also have the code for the osteoporosis if that was uh, the condition that was associated to the pathological fracture. Understand the guidelines with pathological fractures. All of the regional enteritises mean that they have to specify where it's at, okay? And ulcerative colitis, that's going to be your K50 and K51 codes. Really not many other code, uh, K codes are going to risk adjust. That's, that's the big ones. Late effects of stroke, I69. Now, we're going to talk about that again in a minute, right? Because we're going to talk about about CVAs, and I'm also going to highlight some points about TIAs, so heads up on that, make a little note that we're going to be talking about that. So the, the thing about a stroke, and I don't want to talk about too much of it because we're going to actually talk about it in another slide, I-69, you want to know, do they have hemoplegia and the dominant side and et cetera, et cetera, all the guidelines that go around with that. So heads up if you have a patient that had a stroke. You can't code for an acute stroke if you're in the, the clinic, but you can if you're coding off of inpatient documentation, depending what you're doing. So if you're working from an MA plan, right, you're not going to be able to code for a stroke on the pull a stroke code from the, the documentation. Uh, but if you're going through a year's worth of documentation because you're doing an MA plan risk adjustment coding, then you can pull from that, right, the, the inpatient visit. But if you're coding for the clinic or the hospital, that's, that's different, right? Your purpose is different. All malignancies, very seldom are you going to find a malignancy that doesn't risk adjust. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in depth. We're going to talk about some oncology codes. So be very aware of uh, if you see a code that starts with a C or a D up to D44, probably going to carry 
and HCC. So these these are some of the main ones that are routinely captured, but there's some others uh, we're going to like we put on the list in the beginning. But there's over 10,000 codes. And so um, what's going to help you not make a mistake is to increase your knowledge base on these codes. Let's talk about the RAF score. Now, I notice that a lot of times we have students that start the risk adjustment course that we offer and they're all gung-ho because they love ICD, like me, right? So they understand the disease process, they're all excited, and they're like, okay, we got this. However, there's a lot of things about getting the CRC credential that is more than just being able to understand the ICD codes. It's much broader than that. Okay, so let's talk about a few of those things. The first being the RAF score. We've done a couple other educational videos that you can jump into the club and look at. Uh, you may uh, be able to go find them still on the um, YouTube channel. I don't know if it's still actually out, but it might be. You could just type in RAF and see if they're there. But they're definitely in the club. And, uh, and uh, I explained what the RAF score is and why it's so important. But it is highlighted in your course. And on top of that, you're going to be tested on it. So, you know, don't worry about being able to really work out a RAF score because, well, it's actually just addition. But uh, just know what the components of a RAF score mean. The first thing is they're going to take the patient's demographics. Are you a male or female? And how old you are? Because that is going to tell the, the, the initial point of your score then how many HCCs do you have? If you have diabetes, okay, you get a, an HCC for that. If you have CHF, you get an HCC for that. But there's that combo code, right? So you get a higher uh, HCC for your RAF score if you have diabetes and CHF versus them coded individually. And then um, maybe there's an amputation. Then any disease interactions, that would be an amputation, something else going on. Um, there is a new model. Uh, I may tell you what this is. I may tell you wrong. It's the APCC or the APPC. I can't remember exactly what the acronym is. We, uh, we, we have talked about it before. It Just type in in your Google search. Uh, um, let's see, I think I would just type in risk adjustment model 2020 uh, update. And I think that gives, we'll give it to you. Or you can put a note in the club and we'll talk about it in there if you want more information about it. If you're a student right now, probably not going to talk about it because they just started it in 2020. They're not going to test you on it. But the, the fact is, is not only do you get with this new added motto, uh, model, they have a, a combo edition and it's based on ulcers and dementia. So if your patient has dementia, you get a little extra bonus added to the RAF score ultimately is what that means. Abstraction. This is the fun part. This is where, well, this is probably the part I enjoy the most when we go to risk adjustment coding because it is based on the um, the documentation and the disease process, okay? So what we want to do is we want practice, as much practice as you can get on how to abstract an HCC and draw that line that's giving us meat. So the first one that we have is diabetes, type 2 diabetes without complication. So that code, the E11.9, right? Very easy, common code. However, what are we going to use as the meat? Now, if the patient isn't on insulin or anything else is going on, then in the assessment, uh, and they talk about, you know, uh, type 2 diabetes without complications, E11.9. 
nine, then usually under it, you will see some other comment, that's the assessment, that will, or the plan, excuse me, that would uh, be worded like improved or check A1C, you know, so those are common things. Uh, great idea, put in the chat what other verbiage or things that you could see as meet if you had a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. Another uh, HCC that is easily captured if <laughs> your provider documents a level is for depression. So F33.1, moderate depression, and it's stable and continue medications. So you've got your code, you have your diagnosis, what's the meat? Stable, continue medications, jump out to the medication list and see what medications that they're taking for it. The next example is the type 2 diabetes, but this time we have a manis manifestation. We have CKD and the patient's on insulin. So three codes that we're going to get to abstract. E11.2, that's the first code. That's our diabetes with a kidney manifestation. And then we have the manifestation is CKD, and that means we always have to code the CKD stage, which would be the N18.3, and then Z79.4, which we mentioned previously, which is long-term insulin use. So what do we have as verbiage for meat with that? Check A1C. Very, very common that your diabetics, especially when they're on insulin, are going to have their A1Cs checked pretty routinely at least, I think, every three months, six months for sure. CMP, urine, microalbumin, a CMP. Also, these two uh, lab tests also you see them a lot. And then, of course, the insulin that the patient is on, which is Lantus. Uh, this patient's on 20 units, uh, sub-Q, once a day. I would, uh, if you're not familiar with medications for diabetes, what medications like glucotrol uh, uh, or the different names for the, uh, the types of insulin, I would definitely look those up. Jot those down. You know, what are the different types of insulin? Do a little study on that. Maybe we'll do uh, something on the club for that if, if you think that would be beneficial and come up with a little cheat sheet for you to study. You don't have to have them memorized, but it's very important since diabetes is so common and carries such a heavy weighted HCC that we don't miss that. And that when you look at those lists of the meds, then, you know, Lantus and some of the other ones, Humulin, uh, they should just pop off the page for you because you know what they're used for. A little tip about that, units. When you see units, that tells you that, hey, wait, not many things is given in units, but insulin is one of them. Very good. Oh, went the wrong way. Sorry about that. Next, for abstraction, we've got a little more in depth. What about a patient that has an amputation? Now, for the most part, when you're probably doing your book work and everything, they'll have amputations, but they'll mention something like a BKA, below the knee amputation, or an ABA. Uh, or an AKA, above the knee amputation. So lower extremities and, you know, taking off a leg, that's pretty easy to come up with a scenario for a test question. But don't forget, if we lose a toe, that's still risk adjust and it's often missed. Because if a patient's coming in and they have no problems, and uh, they're or, or uh, they're coming in for a cold or or even just routine checking on their diabetes. OK, if you don't dig in and look to see that maybe in uh, the physical exam that an amputated toes mentioned, it's not going to be you're not going to be able to abstract to that. So you want to make sure that you educate your providers that if you have a patient that has an amputation of uh, a, a toe, 
that needs to be documented and carried through with every encounter because it's so often missed and it does make a difference on the RAF score because usually the reason the amputation was done was due to some type of vascular complication or diabetes, which risk adjusts, right? So the fact that we're also stating that our patient uh, has that, dis that, that disease process going on and amputation shows more severity of the, the disease process. So Z89.411, well, if there's not much going on, you know, let's say five years ago, they had their great toe amputated because they stubbed it. They have diabetes and it got gangrene and they ended up lopping it off, you know, but everything's stable and honky-dory now. Well, they're not going to keep, you know, mention it. And, and the patient's probably not even going to take their shoe off, right? Now, if you have a diabetic, they're probably having their foot, their feet checked by a podiatrist though, and that's where you can go and check. If you think, wait a minute, uh, did did they say that patient didn't have a toe? And then uh, if you're working for an MA plan, you can go back and look at a whole year's worth of documentation and they're probably going at least twice a year to the podiatrist to have their nails trimmed. And uh, depending on how fast their nails grow, uh, I can't remember how often Medicare pays for a um, diabetic patient to have the podiatrist check their nails, uh, their toenails. Uh, but if you guys know, go ahead and put that in the chat and let us know. Uh, we'll we'll share that so you can have a heads up. So again, just stating that it's stable is enough of a. Uh, uh, meat or line for us to be able to abstract that. Z89.411, you're going to use up all of your characters when you use, uh, when you're abstracting for, for amputations. Morbid obesity, little education we're going to give here in a minute about obesity because you can't just say the patient's BMI. You've got to have that diagnosis of obesity as well. And not all obesity risk adjusts, only one with a BMI of over 40. So for the meat, we have uh, diet, discussed, exercise, encouraged. And you're going to see that a lot because it's a MIPS protocol, uh, QRSS, and all these other different things that they they check, quality, that... that um, Obesity is often used for that. Lung cancer, C94.90, patient scheduled for radiation treatments managed by oncology. So you can pull that from the PCPs, right? Uh, in fact, if the patient has lung cancer, it doesn't matter who they're seeing, whatever provider. I can't think of a provider that wouldn't comment that the patient had lung cancer, especially if they're actively getting treatment. So let's say they see the podiatrist because they've got pain in their foot, but they have lung cancer. You bet that podiatrist is going to comment on that because the fact that they're getting radiation treatment or any type of cancer treatment is going to affect their extremities, the medication, can do that uh, it, and it, it matters also where they're getting the radiation at even if they're not getting it on um, their feet like a, a, a some type of a bone cancer they wouldn't really get radiation for bone cancer I don't know maybe they would I have to think about that but uh, again it it'll probably be stated at the most simplest uh, verbiage as managed by oncologist and then they may even list who the oncologist is which would be beneficial to you because then if you need to go look at more documentation and go pull more encounters for that patient to get a higher, maybe it just says lung cancer, but there's a higher specificity for lung cancer uh, that you could abstract. Then uh, you can educate the, the provider because if it's the podiatrist that's pulling it, they're just going to pull it off the list, the problem list. So you want the oncologist to make sure that that lung cancer diagnosis is at the highest specificity so that the continuing of care is always showing the best code. Old MI, that's one of my favorite codes. I don't know why. Uh, I think it's because it's 
often missed. Uh, if the person had a heart attack, you know, 20 years ago, but it does show up on the EKG every time they run, it's like, oh, did, did you have a heart attack? Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, like 25 years ago, I had a heart attack. Well, you know, oh, okay, we need to put that in your record. So, uh, uh, I25.2, the old MI code does not carry the, the regular HCC, but it does carry an RX HCC. So again, it's significant depending on whether you're capturing uh, all a complete capture or uh, you're not capturing RX HCCs, it's still one that you want to be aware of. And uh, continue follow up with cardiologist. Very, very simple. Things to be very careful with, and that's going to be a laundry list, meaning you just get a list of diagnoses, but you don't have any other documentation to support it. And I was just doing um, a presentation the other day with some providers telling them, if you want your coder's head to explode, then say that your patient has diabetes but don't give them any meat and we think that that doesn't happen and it does all the time uh, you think well wouldn't there be like the medication that you can link but if they're really healthy diabetic and they don't take uh, they do diet and exercise there may not actually be medication that you can link for that patient you know it's a uh, uh, and so again, that just, you know, I, I think some, sometimes I would get a bruise on my forehead from like banging my head on the table. I was like, you got to be kidding me. I want to capture diabetes. But again, so just a laundry list of diagnoses because some of them may not be current anymore. Uh, just looked at a, a, a chart the other day and the patient uh, had been morbidly obese but they had been working really, really hard throughout the year to lose weight and it was working. So unless you have a BMI of 40 or above, that's morbid obesity. But once you slip below 40, it's no longer morbid obesity. It's obesity is the actual code that should be uh, used. And the patient slipped down, uh, you know, was below 40 but they just kept pulling the, the BMI code and the morbid obesity uh, from the problem list and using it again and again and again. And yet there was valid documentation that, you know, for that visit, the clinician had documented the, the patient's BMI at 36, you know. Uh, so again, be very, very careful that you uh, don't just pull off a problem list and we need to educate our providers about that specificity we always want to make sure that we abstract the highest specificity and again as a CRC you're probably going to be called to help with education and uh, to, for your providers and the clinicians to make sure that those copy and pastes are not being done and that we're it, you know, we have the documentation for the highest specificity great example if you you have CKD unspecified, that carries an RxHC, but uh, if you're not capturing an RxHCC, that, that's nothing. You get no nothing to add to the RAF score. And the higher the RAF score, the more money set aside for the care of that patient. And you don't want to fall short for the next year. Uh, but if they are a stage four, so it would be the code N18.4 for CKD stage four, that carries a, an HCC of 137. And so they get to add to the RAF score of uh, 0 0.237. You know, that's significant. On conflicting documentation, this one was one that was used in another presentation and it was great. You've got all this information in the HPI, but it says uh, there's no diabetic complications because that's just a standard statement that gets used again and again and again. And then you look down at the diagnosis and it says the patient has type 2 diabetes with polyneuropathy and they even picked the right code e11.42 so yeah that's that's problematic i'm seeing some questions pop up so i'm gonna look at those and let's make sure we got those covered oh very very good eureka uh says 
Medicare pays for foot routine care every three months. Appreciate that. Okay, so make a note of that. If you are doing the the CRC, it's not that you have to have it memorized that it's every three months. They're probably not going to ask you a Medicare question like that. But what they would uh, ask you is things like, you know, how often would you want to uh, check for a patient that is getting routine foot care? Well, you know, often or or if they say every three months, but a minimum of like every three months. I knew at least you know, six months. So thank you for looking that up. Three months in one day, three months in one day. Okay. Uh, let's see. Ursula says, if a patient has a toe amputation and we are coding the operative report for that surgery, do we code for the status code of that day? Z89.42. Um, you, if you're only coding for that day, yeah, once that toe is removed that day, they're, they're a status amputation. Absolutely. You can. Uh, Whitney says Z86.73 does not risk adjust, correct? Uh, you'll have to tell me what that is because I, I can't bring it up. My internet's not good enough tonight to do that. So uh, let me know what that, that is, Whitney, and I'll probably be able to tell you off the top of my head if you confirm it. I probably could look over at my cheat sheet, though. <laughs> behind my screen. Um, another really common, <laughs> really funny, in my opinion, uh, documentation that gets conflicting is where you uh, look up in the vital signs and the clinician states that, you know, there's an amputation of a foot or a toe or whatever, uh, or, a, you know, like a BKA. And then in the HPI, it says, uh, or the physical exam, you know, good uh, bilateral pedal pulses. You know, well, that's a conflict. And, you know, routinely that, you know, you could let that go, I guess. You know, it's like, well, you know, the, the it was captured and stuff. But you have to think about the RADV auditors that come in are paid to find mistakes and if they see these documentation mistakes of conflicting information that's red flags for them and if you can mess up something that simple in the documentation the provider does consistently or you know then they're going to start dinging you for everything that they 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 could put you up for another audit because of things like that so be very very careful when you um are looking that if you see that type of conflict that you let your provider education team know or you may be part of that if you're a crc All right, um, well, we get to move to oncology. Okay, so I alluded to some of the things about oncology. So now let's get to the meaty part of the oncology. Uh, whenever we are going to code, we need to know if the patient is actively getting treatment because it would not be a history of if the patient's getting surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation. Three things, those three things. Uh, uh, they could also be getting um, immunotherapy, right, it is is still a part. It's like chemotherapy and immunotherapy sometimes are lumped together, but it might say immunotherapy and then you know that's like chemotherapy that's active. To be able to code a personal history of, the patient could still be under surveillance, right, that they do this, you see this a lot with prostate cancer. They're under surveillance, uh, but they have a history. Or they could be under adjunctive therapy. Now, there is some a uh, little bit of a gray area. It, the drug that comes to mind, of course, is tamoxifen, uh, kind of two schools of thought. But for the most part, if you have a woman who's on tamoxifen and she's already had her surgery, she's had her chemotherapy and the radiation, she's not getting anything else, then really the tamoxifen is adjunctive therapy. And if, it's a, if that's the case, then they would be a history of breast cancer with an ongoing conjunctive you know, therapy. Now, there is exceptions to the rules because there's always exceptions to the rules, right? And just know 
because of things like tamoxifen, if a patient has breast, ovarian, or prostate cancer, and they're on that adjunctive therapy like um, uh, tamoxifen, then you could code that as active therapy, right? Uh, don't don't just say, oh no, you know, they're they're the best thing to do is to query the provider and say, in your opinion, please educate me uh, for this patient. Does the patient act, you know, actively have cancer? Or are you still actively treating it because of the tamoxifen? Or would you consider this an adjunctive therapy and they're now a history of cancer? Get their opinion, make notes of it, make sure everybody in the office knows, put it in the compliance, et cetera, et cetera. So it's well documented and be consistent with it. Now, could you have a patient that um, has uh one patient be history and another one not, but they have the, you know, the, they're both on tamoxifen. Yes, it could be because ovarian cancer, especially with ovarian cancer, it's a little bit different than the um, breast cancer or, or the prostate cancer, or, you know, it's kind of like, it's just waiting to come out someplace else. Right. So the oncologist may have a, different opinion of history of when you're following the guidelines that um, the coding sets forth for you. So know the difference between the primary and the secondary cancers. If you have a patient that has breast cancer and it metastasizes to the lung, right? Breast cancer is primary, and that carries a RAF score, that carries an HCC that has a score. But secondary cancer actually has a higher RAF score than breast can or the primary cancer. So you do not want to miss out on secondary cancers. Now, can a person have two primary cancers? Absolutely, they can. The pathology report would be able to distinguish that. So if you have a documented, uh, documentation for a patient and the provider is saying that the patient has primary breast cancer and primary lung cancer, then you would want to query the provider and say, has one metastasized to the other? And if so, then it, you know, would it be secondary? Or is this two distinct different types of cancers that are standing alone on this patient? Because it will affect their RAF score. Secondary cancers risk score higher than primary cancers. Easy thing to miss. And uh, again, the documentation has to be crystal clear on this for us to make sure that we're getting the appropriate RAF score for our patient. Now we're going to move on to CVAs. I alluded to this earlier. Really confusing because often, I almost said almost 100% of the time, um, you're going to get documentation where your patient comes in and they said, you know, they've got a CVA. Well, the patient's not in the hospital. It's a doctor's office visit. And they had their CVA six months ago. But the documentation still says, and it's active in the problem list, the patient's you know, having a CVA. So those codes, the I63.00 through I63.9, you are not going to be able to use those. They're not to be coded in the office visit. So it would be an error to be able to abstract that, let alone code it and bill it from a doctor's office. And um, what you want to look at is find out if there was residual effects from the CVA, because that does risk adjust. Not all of them, but you know, several of them do. So those are considered sequelas and uh, of the CVA. The I69.00 through the I69.098. It would be really smart of you to go ahead, jot those codes down, then open up your ICD manual in the tabular and follow along on there just like we did before and you just study the verbiage and say, 
ah, okay, this is a residual effect. Do you understand the difference between, um, you know, monoplasia, hemoplasia, things like that? And then when they document the sequela or the late effect, we want to know what was the cause, okay, the CBA. Uh, was it, there's usually laterality involved and so we want to know if it's left or right and then we want to know if it's dominant or non-dominant side now i can tell you that providers are trained very early to to document properly for cvas it's you very seldom are you going to get the documentation where it it, it doesn't tell you it, where it's absent the laterality and the dominance. It does happen, but for the most part, um, that that's just common routine documentation that you'll see. But you may, uh, heads up, see that they're using the codes for a CVA. And really, it's not. It's a history of a CVA. And if they don't have any residual effects, that's a Z86.73 not an I63.00. So again, very often this is uh, a mistake that's that's seen. What is the difference between a TIA and a CVA? Well, there's a big difference because it, and this is the easy way to remember it. A CVA is, you know, a stroke. Big CVA and TIA is a tiny little stroke, okay? Uh, and it's temporary, whereas a CVA is, uh, I, I think of it as complete, big, bad stroke, right? But a TIA is a tiny little temporary stroke that usually doesn't last more than five minutes, okay? Could you have some residual effects that last a little bit longer? Yes, but the key is, is that it goes away. Okay. Now, is a TIA a precursor to a CVA? Absolutely. Uh, can you have more than one TIA? Yes, you can. But that's a, a in the uh, for the provider, that's a red flag. Hey, something's going on. Now, if you're young and healthy and you have the a, a, a TIA, uh, then you know what? Are you a smoker? You know what are other conditions that you know heads up because the you know. Could it happen? Yeah, you could. You just kind of blew a clot, right? But especially in an, a person that's a, of more advanced years and they have other health concerns, especially, you know, um, uh, cardiovascular disease and, and stuff, hyperlipidemia, then a TIA is, you know, oh, something's going on. We need to go in there and look around and make sure that we're not going to throw a, a stroke. Right, because if you have a stroke, you're going to have some residual effects. Usually, not always. So a TIA is uh, acute G45.8 or G45.9. So uh, again, if it's a, an acute active TIA, uh, that's the G45. Uh, it can be coded active for the initial visit, okay, but the subsequent visits. No. Okay. Now, the other thing to note is there's a code for a history of a, C, a TIA, Z86.73. Now, my sister's had a couple TIAs and they've gone in, they checked and everything, and she's a smoker, so that attributes to it. Uh, but she carries the code, the Z86.73, because she's thrown a couple TIAs. Okay. But it's resolved and it's asymptomatic. Don't code a CVA for a TIA and vice versa. For the myocardial infarctions, you'll want to get this right. And it has very high specificity. So uh, again, we want to educate our providers that these codes are available to them because otherwise they're just going to say, you know, um, non-STEMI or STEMI, you know, MI. But we can... Um, actually code for a STEMI, the anterior wall, the inferior wall, other sites. You can see the codes there, non-STEMI I21.4, but these are acute. Now, the difference in this and a CVA, an MI to a CVA, the acute code lasts for 
four weeks and that's 28 days. If a patient has a non-STEMI, I21.4, you know, they get out of the hospital and they go the next week to follow up with their PCP, they're still at I21.4. Unlike if you have a CVA, right? Because you're not actively having a stroke. Uh, that acute uh, window lasts for four weeks. The reason they do that is because they want to document that this is in the first four weeks because you commonly have another one in those four weeks. And so um, if a patient has a subsequent MI outside the four weeks, then that's a different code. That's a subsequent. And if a non-STEMI, a subsequent non-STEMI occurs, that's I22.2. And then again, notice we have anterior wall, inferior, and other. Now, if they've been in the hospital, it will be documented where the MI occurred. And uh, uh, it may get dropped or lost in the doctor's visits afterwards, but you can definitely go check the cardiology notes and you'll be able to get to the highest specificity because once they see that cardiologist they're going to document to the highest specificity and you want to make sure you capture the proper code there again if it's an inferior wall we want to know it's the inferior wall and we don't want to be using that acute mi code the i21 code if it's six weeks after the patients had an mi and if they had, uh, because after the four weeks, it's an I25.2, old MI. Now, that does not carry a regular HCC, but it does carry an RxHCC, and you don't want to miss those old MIs. So if the patient has an acute MI, and in that four-week window, it's very common for them to have another one, that would be a subsequent MI, and then you would code the I22, right? So don't get that confused. That four week window is very important. Acute MI, first four weeks. If they have another one in the four weeks, that's a subsequent I22. But if after the four weeks, if they have um, uh, any visits, and then it's considered an I25.2, old MI. Okay, let me just take a little pause here and look at some of the other questions. Let's we'll see if I can do that without. Backing up to the cancer. For a cancer patient, after a patient completes the treatment, when do we start coding for the history of instead of the active condition? You can only code for the history of when it do it's documented a history of. So, um, that you'll want your provider to do that. If they don't state that it's a history of cancer, then you have to query. They have to state that it's a history of cancer. Otherwise, they're actively getting treatment, right? Um, so I'd query in that. Uh, Whitney says, what if it's a documented, it's documented that the patient has had uh, lymphoma since 2012? Uh, that is so vague and it doesn't make it clear if it's in remission or not, do you need to query? Yes, but do remember that liquid tumors don't ever end, okay? So that you're probably not going to have any type of blood, uh, bone um, type of cancers, lymphatic cancers. They are considered liquid and they don't, they don't stop. You, you technically never get rid of them. You may be in remission, but you still tech, you know, so yeah, you can, you can ask about that. Uh, with the MI, does the four weeks start over in a subsequent MI? Uh, you know what? That's a good question. And yes, it does. Yeah. So if you have an MI and um, you, um, uh, a week later, you have another MI, that's a subsequent MI. And then if you don't have anything else, then you're an old MI. But if you have another heart attack uh, after that, like say on week three, you're still there. 
So yes, every time you have an MI, then you get another four weeks and then another four weeks. Yeah, and hopefully you don't keep having them. Morbid obesity could be reported when BMI 35 with comorbidity. I'm not sure uh, uh, that is, um, Yves, the if there is a comorbidity, um, as far as I know, uh, please educate me and let me know. Put in the chat the information uh, where, where you got that. Uh, everything that I've done with our policies is that if a patient has morbid obesity, and which I think that's the next slide. Let me just switch it. Let's see if I went the right way. There you go, obesity. Uh, so uh, morbid obesity, you're going to be focusing on E66.01. That's morbid obesity. Uh, and the for it to risk adjust, it has to be morbid. And morbid is classified as uh, 40 and above. And then it, it changes. It's 0 0.41, 0 0.42. You know, uh, there's a we we did it's in the club there's a little scale a uh, graph or something that you can look at that so z68.41 is an uh, bmi of 40 to 44.9 now yves says that if um morbid obesity could be reported if you have a bmi of 35 with a comorbidity um tell me what the core morbidity comorbidity would be that uh, would do that and that might help me understand and then but I, I I'm just not familiar with that at, at all um, now if you have a if you have a patient that's a diabetic or maybe they have um, uh, Prater Willie or Willie Prater syndrome you know that because that makes uh, them not be able to stop eating so uh, so it's she's stating diabetes, hypertension, and liver disease, heart disease, and and gout. Okay, so let me know, know where you got that because if that's the fact, then I would like to be able to do a presentation on that. That would be great for our club webinar. All right, so that thanks. Uh, BMI is the only one uh, the only one tool used to diagnose a patient if the provider says patient has morbid obesity with a BMI of 37 you code as morbid obesity per coding clinic. There you go. And there is a coding clinic for that. Patient of the provider states morbid obesity. Uh, let's see Shaveri says, if the patient has a BMI of 35 and the provider documents a uh, uh, comorbid condition of diabetes or HDA, it can be um, reported. Okay, good, good. Well, then I will go pull the coding clinic and we will have additional education on that where I can um, uh, add that for us so we can all share. And Humana guidelines. Thank you, Yves. Okay, so she uh, is telling me that we can get that off the Humana guidelines, which is really, really important. Now, um, uh, Medicare is has has one guideline that they follow, right? And usually everybody follows them, but you have the big ones like Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, you know, uh, United Healthcare, Humana. Uh, the, they're the the big wigs and what they say goes right so um, again that's that's good to know oh he's a he, oh Yves I'm sorry I was calling you a girl <laughs> I don't know anybody with that name I apologize <laughs> did I say Yves correctly though let me know yeah and um since I'm uh French name, okay. Well, there you go. See, I was thinking Spanish and and everything. That's that's uh, that's fun. Good. Thank you for educating me on that. And again, if you can um, put in the club, because I'm pretty sure you're part of the club because of the questions coming in from you directly, uh, then let's do that. Let's work on coming up some with something that surrounds that coding guideline with the Humana guidelines so that we can differentiate. 
great stuff. I love learning uh, something like that that's different. And I, I won't tell you now, but you'll have to go in and hear my story about the uh, person that it was a webinar like this. We were live and they're saying, well, what about diabetes 1.5? turn to diabetes 1.5 well there is and I just didn't know about it at the time you know and here I think I'm so savvy with the ICD-10 and stuff but nope you can never not learn or you can never stop learning I'm always learning so thank you guys for helping with that and we'll do we'll do some special education on it specifically okay uh, let's move forward I think we're getting kind of close to the end yes the annual wellness visit so this slide directly comes from um, uh, Baylor Scott and White, some education that they give. And so I want to give kudos and a shout out to them. Absolutely fantastic. A heads up, this was provi for providers. These are the um, often missed and overlooked HCCs that uh, can be you it can, need to be documented on the annual wellness visit or that they're often documented on the annual wellness visit so let's just go over them quickly the amputation status we we talked about those because they're frequently missed artificial openings uh tracheostomy yeah that person's probably got a lot going on but you know a lot of time patients have uh colostomies and they're going in and seeing the pcps and and stuff um cystostomies and I did, uh, I read a report today, actually, that one of the cystostomies is they actually route it through the appendix. So cool. I didn't even know you can do this. Uh, it's called an ap appendic. It's spelled funny. Uh, uh, cystostomy. Uh, transplant status. So again, heart, lung, liver, pancreas, bone marrow, stem cell. Uh, radiology, uh, radiological findings like calcification, uh, as well as an AAA, which is an abnormal, uh, excuse me, abdominal aortic aneurysm. I can't wear my glasses because they put too much of a glare on there. Okay, so uh, paralytic syndromes, the hemoplegia, uh, quadriplegia, paraplegia. Then morbid obesity, which we've discussed quite a bit, alcohol and drug dependence. And that is uh, something that's often captured for these MIPS and quality measures, just like the obesity. Uh, I would like to also tell you that uh, one that we see that gets missed pretty frequently or not to the highest specificity is the depression. So uh, we want to educate because it usually just says the patient has depression. Well, we need to know, is it mild, moderate, or severe for it to be able to risk adjust, not just unspecified and anxiety and stuff like that too. So uh, very good information. This particular slide, if you are in the club, you'll have access to this and you can make notes for yourself that these are frequently overlooked and you want to uh, be aware all the time for any key words that are going to make these jump off the page so they're not missed. I think that about wraps it up for us. Let's see. That's it. And again, I wanted to do a special shout out for um, BSW Health. Uh, uh, the North Texas team came up with that one. And one of the other slides that, that I was able to, to pull from for provider education. And so uh, there's a lot of roles that you can do if you're a CRC, not just working for the MA plans like Humana, uh, United Healthcare. You may be working now in the doctor's offices in the clinic systems as a risk adjustment coder. Uh, a lot of them, I think the team the for Baylor, Scott & White, they have over 30 or 40 on their team for North and Central Texas. So again, that's a fun job. So that wraps it up for tonight. Any other questions? Let me just look. Yes, we all grow together. Absolutely. I, you know, I don't mind at all to be called out on something if I misinform you guys, and especially on a student webinar, because students are on there and if something is ambiguous or you're confused, if I don't know and can't clarify it in the webinar, for the student webinar or whatever, uh, then we'll follow up in the club because that's where we continue this conversation. So 
know that you can just get out there and, and keep commenting. I'll be in there as well of our subject matter experts. We have students, you know, students in there. We have interns in there helping to look up stuff. So uh, again, I, I never mind. It doesn't hurt my feelings any to, to be caught on something because I don't know at all. I like to think I do, but I don't. Uh, let's see, the CRC study guide states that the diagnosis of obesity, morbid obesity, et cetera, are coded only when documented as such by the treating providers and never assumed, page 135 in the CRC study guide. Yes. Now, let me give you a differ something to differentiate these two because you're like, wait a minute, that's really conflicting. But the coding um, clinic is for mainstream coding, not risk adjustment. Okay, so that may be why we're getting a little bit of a conflicting uh, message there. Right. So uh, now Humana is a major MA. And if they accept it, then maybe you know, you could do that. But the education that we provide, like for Baylor, Scott and White, mm -mm, they don't they don't allow it. Uh, however, that doesn't mean that's 100 percent because, you know, United Healthcare may say uh, yes or human, you know. So, again, uh, it's important that that we we get more research and clarify. So that could be it, that it's the uh, difference between regular clothing for a visit versus coding for risk adjustment and what risk adjustment or CMS will accept for the RAF score. Okay, that could be a clarification. Thank you, Wendy, for bringing that up. Uh, you're welcome. Christina uh, says, thanks for the information. These student webinars are really, really fun. Uh, we dig down and, and sometimes it can be very, very basic and other times it can be pretty complex stuff. Does receiving the TPA make any difference in RA? No, it does not. Uh, for a CVA, it's not. It'll tell you what type of stroke the patients had because they're not going to give TPA to a hemorrhagic stroke, right? You bleed out, your head would probably explode. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. Uh, so um, it does tell you, though, what type of a stroke the person has. If they apply, they administer TPA, it's not a hemorrhagic, it's an ischemic stroke, not a um, hemorrhagic. So that is a, a good point to make. Uh, Lizzie is in the Humana plans. If you have a BMI of 35 uh, and comorbidities, then they can code it. Okay. So again, that may be the Humana plan for regular coding. But again, Humana is one of the big wigs that has an MA plan. So it'll be interesting to see if the MA plan for Humana. Uh, a will allow that for risk adjustment as well. So we'll do more research. Um, thank you for, for letting us know. Camilla, thank you. She said it was a wonderful webinar. Yes, I love this topic. Okay, Yavez, sir, we'll, uh, I'll see you guys in the club and we'll continue this conversation and, and continue to educate each other. Now I want to see a picture of Yavez, uh, since I know that he's a French man, and I wonder if he's got a French accent. <laughs> we might have to get him on a webinar to talk to us. Okay. Bye, guys. Thank you. See you next time.